Welcome to this evening's parental guidance episode, Raising Healthy Eaters, Intuitive Eating for Kids. My name is Monica Oslander Moreno, and I am a registered dietitian in private practice here in Miami, but I will have the pleasure of tag teaming tonight with another registered dietitian. Before we get into the meat, so to speak, of our presentation tonight, I would like to go through some housekeeping. Number one, mark your calendars as parental guidance is now being held every third Thursday of the month. Parental guidance has a new home at www.parentalguidance.org where you can stay up to date on upcoming episodes and find past recordings and resources. Now, regarding you Health Jackson Children's Care and Messaging, our pediatric emergency room at the Holtz Children's Hospital, Jackson North Medical Center, and Jackson West Medical Center are available 24 7, staffed with board certified pediatric emergency medicine specialists. At Holtz, doctors and nurses are certified in pediatric advanced life support, also known as PALS, and our U Health Jackson Urgent Care Centers have partnered with UMNSU CARD, University of Miami, Nova Southeastern University Center for Autism and Related Disabilities to achieve their autism friendly designation, the first in Florida. This designation means that our staff at all five urgent care locations have been specially trained and all of our centers have a specially designated sensory friendly exam room to give all patients the opportunity to experience healthcare in a safe and controlled environment. Now with great pleasure, I would like to introduce my dear friend and fellow registered dietitian, Christy Nicole Garner, Masters of Science, Registered Dietitian, Clinical Dietitian for the Division of Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition in the Pediatric Department at the University of Miami. Here's a brief bio of Christy. Christy is a clinical dietitian specializing in pediatrics. She has worked in multiple settings, including intensive care, private practice with me, and in the outpatient setting, helping parents and other healthcare providers provide optimal nutrition for children from neonatal care to adolescence. She currently supports the pediatric gastroenterology department at the University of Miami, working in the interdisciplinary setting to serve children and families in Miami-Dade and Broward County with unique gastrointestinal and nutritional needs. She's an active member of multiple pediatric nutrition societies, as well as an advocate for nutrition equity and furthering the field of pediatric nutrition in the local community. Christy believes that every child and family deserves to eat foods which nourish not just the body, but also the soul, and to be happy and healthy eaters for life. I would tend to agree. And it is my utmost pleasure to serve as her moderator tonight. And let us begin with question number one. And I would urge you and ask humbly that you put your questions, and hopefully we'll get to them, into the little question box, the Q&A box. Okay, Christy, let's hear from you. All there right. you are. There you are. All okay. right, number one, we have a list of questions, like I said, but please feel free to supplement in the Q&A box because we got two dietitians here and we are hungry, so to speak, for your questions. So we'll start off with what is the best way to feed your infant when they are developmentally ready for solids? And by this, I mean the age old, what becomes a debate of purees versus something called baby led weaning. Well, thank you, Monica, for that introduction. Um, and I'm very excited to be uh, you know, speaking tonight in reference to this topic. Uh, so uh, in reference to your first question, as far as um, first foods, developmental readiness for solids. So there, most of us when we think, or a lot of us when we think of, of like being ready for solids, um, it tends to be around the four to six months range. And that's when we start noticing that the infant is um, being able to sit up more um, like unassisted, um, having better head and neck control and generally just having a more of an interest in kind of like the foods that they see family eating. And with the whole purees versus baby led weaning. So some people may not be familiar with baby led weaning um, as 
probably I'm going to guess that most of us were raised on purees. <laughs> I certainly um, was. So tell me what baby led weaning is and why my parents and in-laws think it is absolutely bananas. <laughs> a lack of a better word. <laughs> so um, pretty much what baby led weaning is um, it's well before the 1920s, really the like baby food and jar baby purees wasn't necessarily like a thing. Um, so we've kind of like through the years been just kind of trained that this was the way that we feed babies. Um, but pretty much baby led weaning is more of a um, approach to allow for the baby to kind of have more interaction with the food themselves. So it's more like self-fed. Um, and instead of using like pureed foods, also having foods that are more almost like finger foods. So um, about the um, like the thickness or length of like two fingers. Um, and you want to also be sure that the foods for baby led weaning are more softer foods. So almost like squishable or like what they call like a squish test, where if you mm -hmm. like squish them between your fingers that they kind of, um, you know, they give and, and they get soft, um, not something like hard, like, uh, you know, just like carrot. a carrot. Exactly. That's right. the word but a boiled carrot is perfect <laughs> because they like to pick it up and it's squishy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so pretty much there is no right or wrong option as far as if a family wants to do purees or baby led weaning. Um, it, you know, but it is important once the baby becomes at least around like nine months of age that there is a little bit more texture and consistency as it helps with developing more oral motor skills and also um, like pincer grafts and whatnot. Um, so what is the pincer graft for those of us who do not know like pretty much this. <laughs> yeah like little like the crab yes exactly <laughs> um so so pretty much um there is it, it, you're going to notice a lot of my like my answers in, in nutrition are going to oftentimes be it depends um will be the answer um because nutrition is not black and white so um it's important to keep in mind that if you're not comfortable with the the thought or idea of baby led weaning, then that's probably not the right way for you to start. Um, and maybe you're better off trying more of purees. Um, and some people, you know, you can do a combination of the two. There's again, no right or wrong way, um, but you just wanna make sure that they're being exposed to those foods often, um, or new foods often, and um, there's plenty of variety in the diet. I think it's important to realize that a hybridized approach, some foods are naturally pureed like soup and yogurt. And, you know, you know how I feel about kefir. <laughs> I feel very strongly about it. I have many strong opinions on kefir. Um, you know, it's some foods are going to be naturally soft. Some foods are going to have different textures. That's how we create eaters who are accustomed to a variety of different textures and colors. Um, you know, so if you're doing, you know, you don't have to be diehard baby led weaning and oh, no yogurt, that's a puree. I don't think that's necessarily the best option. Yeah, exactly. Agreed. And if you're looking for um, real time baby led weaning experiences, my seven month old is going through it right now. So you can follow me on Instagram <laughs> as Christy does. <laughs> eat like Monica, although right now it's eat like my seven month old who tonight had some eggplant, which was pureed a little bit, some blackberries, which, you know, they can pick up with the pincer grasp. Um, and we should talk about complementary foods for iron because our second question. So what do you feed these babies when you start with solids? What do you actually feed them? Okay. So, um, this is a very common question I get in, in a clinic, especially when it's, um, a baby who's about to be transitioning, um, you know, where they're reaching that point where they're developmentally appropriate for solids. Um, so it's important to keep in, to also kind of think about what the baby has been fed up into that point. So for example, a baby who's exclusively breastfed, um, which of course is, is the, the, um, sorry, the, the guidelines, but not all of us are able to provide breast, um, breast milk exclusively. So, um, if a baby is exclusively breastfed, it is important that the 
first foods that there are good sources of iron because um, as the baby is, babies are all born with their own iron reserves. Breast milk is not a great source of iron. So we do um, want to make sure that those first foods are going to be good sources of iron. So, I mean, that could literally be um, beef. I know like most people don't think of like providing beef for a baby, um, <laughs> um, especially as a first food. But... You and me thought about it, of course. Beef is great. Yeah. That was my, that was both my baby's first food was a red meat, bison yeah. puree. Yeah. And like, it could also be even something like lentils, you know, where that Mm -hmm. like consistency is nice and squishy and and soft um, and almost more puree like, Um, you know, and then also um, other foods that could be good sources of iron. Um, Obviously, we we have a preference more for those like heme, so to say, or animal sources of iron. But there's also foods that are not from animals that contain iron. So like we mentioned, the beans or like the lentils. also other good sources of iron are like dark leafy green vegetables. Um, so again, trying to have that exposure to the all the, all the different array of um, food groups is important. And tell us how we can amplify the iron av- absorption and availability in the body with complementary foods and how we might not want to serve certain foods with iron with dairy foods. Yes. So, um, so as far as, um, helping enhance that bioavailability of the iron, um, so iron is a mineral, right. And, uh, calcium is also a mineral and they, and in our guts, minerals and all our nutrients kind of compete for absorption. And the two that like to compete Um, a lot for absorption are going to be iron and calcium. So it is important to make sure that if you are, when you are providing these great sources of iron that you're trying to not provide them um, kind of like with either formula or with um, breast milk, which is going to be a much higher source of calcium. Um, And then also there's ways that we can further enhance the, the iron bioavailability of other foods by um, also providing sources of vitamin C. So what are sources of vitamin C? So sources of vitamin C are going to be um, a lot of fruits. So we initially like to think of like a lot of citrusy fruits with sources of vitamin C, but other sources of vitamin C that aren't just fruits um, like, you know, oranges. Uh, or or lemons are going to be things like strawberries, um, even like red peppers are great sources. Broccoli is a great source of vitamin C. So, you know, pairing these other fruits or vegetables with that form of iron, you know, which not only babies should be having, but everyone. So this kind of, yeah, this goes for everyone. This isn't just baby <laughs> like this iron calcium thing is for all the humans. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so definitely trying to have that, um, complementary of, of nutrients at the meal. And, and you also, unless you're introducing like, um, more of like an, a top allergen food, I would say you don't always necessarily have to have, um, one food at a time that you're, Oh, I would always serve at least we always have three. Yeah. Yeah. So again, but if, if you're introducing like a top allergen food and then, you know, it is probably better that you try to serve maybe just that one food or serve it with a food that we know is already a well tolerated and safe food um, to try to tweeze out if there are any reactions that you know what that uh, food may have been. Absolutely. Now switching gears from babies who I now consider easy because I have a toddler. And let's say that my toddler does not want to eat any foods and the only way is if we force them Mealtime is unpleasant and stressful and manic. What should we do? So um, again, another very common um, concern that I hear from a lot of parents, Um, but it's important um, to remember that with mealtime, so there's this wonderful um, kind of, as you can say, like philosophy, so to say, um, called like the division of responsibility, um, where it kind of 
pretty much parents have a responsibility with feeding and then the child has a responsibility with feeding and mealtime. So what the parent is in charge of, so they're in charge of what is served, right? Um, when, so, you know, you're in charge of what time you're serving it, um, where it's served. And then really the child is in charge of how much of that food they're going to eat or if they're going to eat any of it at all. Okay. So that is a, like, and when we kind of um, cross those lines. So when like the parents trying to then say, you know, how much should be eaten or if the child's trying to be the one to, to be telling of what should be eaten, you know, a, a cr like across of those um, responsibilities, then there ends to end up being a lot of like food fights, so to say. So it's really important to just try to eliminate and reduce having as much stress um, in mealtime and just, you know, you're in charge of the menu um, and toddler years is a, is a time where the, you know, your, you know, children are experimenting kind of with their levels of autonomy and control. And it of course only gets um, amplified as the years go on. But, um, you know, the only things that that kids feel like, you know, the only things that, that, you know, a toddler may feel that they have somewhat control over may be like, you know, their food almost, and maybe like what they eat or what they, or so not the way they eat, like what they, you know, wear sometimes or, so it's, it's important to <laughs> sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes, <laughs> um, it's important to really just, um, you know, set those boundaries during mealtime. And you may even realize that once you kind of like let go of those food fights that um that their appetite may improve just because they don't feel so stressed um because that whole environment in mealtime um not just like what is being served but that tension can really make um you know make or break that experience and we want to make sure that the environment is as conducive to help with uh promoting a, a positive experience and, you know, positive appetite. I always like to say that speaking of positive, the letter P is important at mealtimes for positive, pressure-free, playful, and the poker face, which Chrissy, you will soon have the delight of experiencing keeping a poker face in the face of a three-year-old who is having all of the feelings and thoughts yes. at mealtime. And the less you react, the better the outcome will be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and even if they don't enjoy the, they're not enjoying the food, trying to almost spin it into a positive um, is really like, it can, can really kind of change the, um, the setting and, you know, prevent again that food fight, but for sure. So we're gonna ride that food fight wave and get into some of the Q and A's now. Mm -hmm. because we have struck a nerve. <laughs> How, speaking of toddlers and other children in general, how would you recommend helping an extremely picky eater? And how would you even clinically define picky eating? Okay, so, um, so picky eating, um, I feel like is a very general term. Um, and it, it, it can, it can almost be left up into the interpretation of like who, you know, of the parent or, you know, you know, the person in, in front of, of the child. Um, but it's actually quite normal. Um, and, and in, especially once toddler years begin that, children start to become a little bit more selective as far as their the, the foods that they're accepting uh, excuse me so it becomes more of a concern when there's complete like food groups that are are eliminated um so if a child will not eat anything that contains any form of uh, protein or um, anything. So 
that contain that that's a fruit or vegetable. So like that's when we're slightly more concerned is just because those, um, you know, certain food groups provide us with certain nutrients. Um, and it's important to, to really try to understand why your child may be possibly, um, you know, picky or select. I like to say selective rather than picky, um, just because I feel like picky sounds a little, um, has more of like a negative connotation. Um, so trying to understand, is it a texture issue? Um, is it a color issue? Um, so what is the exact, you know, uh, you know, selectivity that they're displaying? Um, Cause maybe it may need to be addressed with like a feeding therapist or a speech therapist. Um, maybe it needs to be addressed um, with like behavioral therapy. So there's, there's other um, important factors that go into play with, with picky or selective eating. Um, but it's important. So how do we, how do we help? How can, you know, what are some mm -hmm. strategies for assistance? So some strategies for, I mean, maybe um, if you can give me like a, like an example, like a, doesn't want to eat any protein, for example. So common things that we have seen, they only want beige foods. They only want nuggets, pasta, pizza, you know, kid foods, or they just okay. will not eat or they will scream or there will be, there will be a consequence. Okay. So, um, what's important to keep providing is making sure that you at, at the, at every meal, um, you're able to provide a safe food and then also provide a small amount of a food that maybe they're resistant to. So let's say, I don't know, we'll say that it's broccoli that they're extremely resistant to at the moment, um, but they really love um, mashed potatoes and chicken fingers. So um, still provide them with, you know, the mashed potatoes, possibly provide them with some chicken, um, but then with that vegetable or that food that they're be, that they're very resistant towards trying to provide a very small amount of it on the plate. So um, if they see a smaller amount of that food that maybe they may be afraid of or or whatever the the issue may be causing their um, you know selectivity with that food, if they see a small amount rather than seeing a whole serving, they're going to be more likely to try it. Um, and really try it's to not as overwhelming. It's not exactly. as overwhelming. Yeah, it's not as overwhelming. Um, and also really try to, um, you know, depending on the age, of course, um, making it age appropriate. So like if it's, you know, a younger, you know, school age child, um, you know, trying to relate it to maybe like one of their favorite books or relating it to their toys or like maybe they're really enjoying dinosaurs right now or they're really enjoying like unicorns so try to kind of incorporate the the things that interest them and be like you know kind of incorporate that thing that they're maybe a little hesitant towards or like selective or picky towards um to really make it kind of fun for them um and and less scary that is great. And yes, aesthetics can go a long way, shapes and colors and redesigning. I mean, I just happen to know from experience, yeah. um, but, but yes, and we, you can say, you know, you might not like it yet. And we call them, you know, love it foods, learning to like it. Don't yeah. love it yet. You know, it's all about, and keeping your Poker game face, face on. Yeah. Um, so the natural follow-up question to that will be, but then they won't eat anything what will I do? Am I starving them? Help. Well, again, you want to make sure that you're providing like a safe food. So we want to make sure that they're eating a little bit of, you know, they're eating something. Um, but if, if you're noticing that they finished their dinner and they're, you know, they're still hungry because they didn't eat the other foods that were on the plate that were not appetizing to them at that mo time and place, um, it is important to revert back to that division of responsibility and feeding and say, and remember, okay, I'm in charge of the menu as the parent or caregiver. Um, and 
I set what's on the menu. Of course, the last thing we want to do is have a screaming, crying child and have a tantrum and, um, you know, everyone having a bad time. But after one or two times of this happening, like, it, you know, as long as they're developmentally appropriate, then there shouldn't be an issue. Um, it's a conversation starter for, you know, mm -hmm. for older children who might have the, the wherewithal to understand, you know, well, you know, that this was the menu tonight and this was dinner and then you didn't eat it. So now you're feeling hungry and that must be really hard. Can I offer you a snack? And, you know, the bedtime snack has to be super unexciting, like <laughs> a cheese stick, an apple. No, yeah. I don't want it. Well, then you must not be hungry. There will be breakfast tomorrow. And when I gave a picky eating lecture with a therapist, she was like, you kind of have to sometimes put them to bed hungry. They will not die, you know? And yo, my mom, who I think is listening to this, she, that is, we were the cause and effect learning. I mean, that is how we learned to not stay up till two in the morning, jumping around in the bed because you had to get up and go to school the next day. I subscribe to that parenting style. You might not be so comfortable with it. You, the collective you, but I think it, it generally gets the desired effect, you know, and, and food and behavior are so linked and related that sometimes, you know, you have to, you know, kind of teach them in that more difficult, uncomfortable way. Yeah, for sure. It's hard in practice. I know, you know, and, and by the way, what you can say to them when they start screaming, when you put something in front of them is just, this is the menu tonight, or I want X, Y, Z. I want dinosaur candy for dinner. That's not on the menu tonight. Yeah, you know that's the response, and just keeping it cool. Now, next question. Um, someone asked, "My child doesn't eat chicken. She doesn't eat meat. Are there any other protein sources I can provide her?" <laughs> so yes, you, like, there are. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so chicken and meat aren't the only two forms of protein. Um, yes, they are what we like to like, you know, a higher protein quality, so to say, um, for our intestines to absorb, but there are many, many, many other forms of protein. So, um, for example, eggs are an excellent source of protein. Um, even dairy is a good source of protein. Um, we also want to make sure that, you know, keeping in mind that a lot of sources of protein may also be good sources of iron, but dairy isn't always. So making sure that we're varying the rest of the diet with other sources of iron. But um, for example, uh, legumes, so different beans, lentils, um, you know, chickpeas. So all those different foods are going to be great sources of, um, of protein. Um, and then also complementing them with um, grains, ideally whole grains, of course. Um, which would be a nice form of like complementary protein. Um, so peas as well. Um, you know, again, like nuts, seeds. Um, so there's really just, there's a lot of different forms of protein that aren't just meat. Um, I know like we're, we like to think a lot of times, like I've, I've had families, like just my child won't eat any, you know, won't eat the protein. But when we go over a full like diet recall and we find out what they're eating in the whole day, they're meeting their, their protein needs by lunchtime. So, um, really if they don't want to have a piece of chicken or the meat at dinner time, it's perfectly okay. This actually happened tonight. My son for dinner normally is really into what I call flesh protein, which I know is not a very beautiful aesthetic way to put it, but it makes sense in my dietitian mind, you know, like the meat of something. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, what do you want for dinner? And he goes in Spanish, I want almonds. And I was like, okay, do you want anything else? Cucumber. I'm like, okay, anything else? And he's like a cheese stick. And I'm like, you know, he has had so much protein up to this point today that dinner is really just extra as far as protein is concerned. And he ate that and he was happy. And then he asked for a sparkling water. Okay. <laughs> year olds but yes that it's also protein and nutrient intakes are not just meal specific it's throughout the course of the day the week the month the growth chart so christy and i are always like show us the growth charts you know how are the trends so one day does not a starvation make one day does not an incredibly healthy day make so mm -hmm. try to you know maybe look at 
the macro picture before you micro in on, is there six grams of protein at this very meal? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Now, what would be your guidance when a child of five years of age is not touching his lunch at school? And I know people complain about this all the time. The lunchbox comes home mushy and full of food. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, first off, I would, um, I'd probably ask uh, the the teacher about like what the environment looks like at school, like what's going on. Um, oftentimes I'll hear that um, children don't have enough time to eat lunch during, you know, lunchtime. They're only given, you know, 20 five minutes or so. And then by the time they go to sit down, they feel rushed and they're not able to eat. So, I mean, there, there could be a variety of different factors that are coming into play in this particular scenario. Um, but, um, really, you know, ask, you know, not only ask questions to the teacher, but also possibly asking questions to your child and be like, Oh, I noticed that, you know, you didn't eat your lunch today. Like, is there something, was there something wrong with your lunch or what happened during lunchtime and, and kind of make it like a conversation with them. Cause you know, at five years old, you know, they're able to, to have, you know, conversations and, and able to express their feelings. Um, so it's important to kind of find out what's happening from their perspective and then also what's happening from like that school perspective. Um, but, you know, maybe they're just too, excited during lunchtime. There, there can be a, a variety of different factors. So I think it, it probably just needs a little bit more exploring. Absolutely. I, and I've, we've seen particularly loquacious children just be so excited to socialize at lunch. They just do not get into their lunch. Um, someone asked, my son has been eating the same food since he turned two. He has ADHD and has never tried new foods. What would your recommendation be as to how to introduce a new food? And I think we got into this a little before, but particularly like vegetables and fruits, which tend to be less welcome to older children. Yeah. Um, so kind of similar, like similar response to earlier. Um, but then also, um, there's a technique called like food chaining, um, too, that may be something you may want to consider. Um, it is more of a technique used kind of with, um, with feeding therapy, but it's kind of like, so for example, like, let's say, um, you know, your son may only like want to have potato chips or, um, and, but getting him to actually eat a potato may be really difficult. So you kind of, um, modify slowly the texture and the consistency of that, you know, potato to then actually be, let's say it's, mashed potato, or it's um, just a, a baked potato. Um, so kind of going from that consistency of that hard, crunchy, chewy food, that there's hard and crunchy food that he um, currently accepts very well to something that may um, be unfamiliar to him with time. Again, this is like a process. This isn't something that's going to happen like, you know, from one day to the next that they're going to just, you know, want to have, um, you know, a, a boil, like a baked potato. Um, so it will take time. Um, there's actually a resource that I provide um, uh, later that actually has more examples as far as food chaining. So I'd probably recommend for you to stay to the end to, to be able to get that resource as well. Um, but food chaining and trying not to overwhelm with those new foods. And the key to really getting not only a child, but any human <laughs> person to eating or trying a new food is just having repeated exposure to it. So if you're finding that you're not exposing your child to, you know, said fruit or vegetable because they've just um, haven't accepted it in the past, so you just avoid even providing it, then it really will behoove you and your child to try to incorporate it more on a regular basis. Um, so that even, even if it's not touched, you know, it could just be at the table, you know, and then little by little we'll make it to their plate and then possibly over time be eaten. So it's really just kind of like playing the long game kind of and um, repeated exposures over time which um, I know for, for many isn't the answer they'd like to hear. I think we've 
discussed it's like 33 exposures in the literature is up to 33 exposures before I mean in our in, in a in a clinical and personal experience they go through these food jags where they are obsessed with something and they will not eat this and then one day they want the food that they didn't want anymore and if you just can kind of if you nixed that food for example we went through a tomato experience tomatoes had to be everywhere then they could not even be within a five mile radius of the house and then if I had just stopped serving them, my list of foods and accepted vegetables would have been whittle, 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 whittled down to nothing. So you kind of have to just keep, and I know it can seem wasteful, but you just have to put one on there and then you can eat it after, give it to the dog, you know? So yeah. that's the thing that happened. Okay, next question. We have a two-year-old grandson. He has been eating organic low sugar pouches, such as vegetables, fruit, and yogurt. He doesn't want to eat any solid foods except cut up fruit. How can we get him to give up the pouches without starving him and eat new foods? We've tried introducing chicken, beef, and cooked vegetables by themselves with no success. So everyone, everyone's going through the same thing here. Yeah. <laughs> Children. <laughs> so, um, so it sounds like, the, so they're mostly relying on like the, like puree for- It sounds like the, pou like the pouches, you okay. know, and, and there are ones that don't have added sugars and, you know, we recommend ones that are, you know, even just proteins and vegetables, but mm -hmm. now it seems like this young grandson um, is resisting most other solid foods. Besides I mean, I fruit. Would, oh, so, so whole fruit, they will consume them. He will consume cut up fruit. Okay. I'm guessing it's probably soft in texture, but um, if. Unclear. If the consistency across the board is only like, you know, pouch it, like kind of like puree pouch foods at two years old, I would probably say it could deem being evaluated by like a, a feeding therapist. Um, Cause maybe there may be some, some like type of like sensory issues um, that may need to be looked into further. Um, so with feeding issues, I think it's important to, to always kind of um, seek out resources like, like a feeding therapist. Um, they're, they're extremely, extremely important and useful and helpful um, and are able to help with, with that texture um, issues that may arise. Um, as long, so I would again kind of also mentioned to try to look at the growth, their growth, like if, are they growing appropriately? Um, if so, then, then it would be a little bit less of a concern, but still having, um, a feeding therapist may be, um, something you want to look into. And I'm not sure if that, if I answered that question fully. No, I think that, that, that is a fantastic yeah. response. Um, I would wholeheartedly agree. Um, how do you encourage healthy eating without labeling foods as good versus bad? I love this because we do not label foods as good versus bad, and we don't even label them healthy or unhealthy, especially for children. So how do we reframe and rework language around food and encourage more nutrient dense, nutrient supporting, growth supporting foods for kids? Okay. So, um, I, I, I really do like this question as well. <laughs> um, so it's important like how you mentioned in your question to kind of remove that like good versus bad and just like treat food as what it is. Food is food. The only food that I would consider as like possibly like bad food, maybe the food that like, if you have a food allergy or if you have, um, you know, if the food is like rotten and, you know, um, then that's probably food that we don't want to be eating because it's not going to to have good, you know, beneficial effects in our bodies. Um, but assuming that all, you know, all other foods, um, we just want to kind of just have it as an equal playing field. So really just, you know, making sure that we don't try to have that whole like clean your plate club to have dessert. So not using food as a reward is important um, because once you have that, a food, that they have to, you know, finish to get and get to this reward food, then you're creating that reward food. Let's say it's, you know, cookies or ice cream or whatever may be that food for dessert, then 
that food kind of gets on a pedestal and then it's like, Oh, I have to finish this. Like, you know, my vegetables and my, you know, pasta or whatever the food might be served for dinner so that I can get to this like really yummy food. Um, and so just kind of removing that, um, putting food on a pedestal, um, and just talking about food as food and, and, you know, having all different types of foods available in the house. Um, of course, like, you know, not stockpiling the, the pantry with a bunch of, <clears throat> excuse me, dessert foods. Um, but having there be maybe like one or two options. Um, so that way it's not something that is more um, coveted or wanted more so than, you know, just other foods like fruits and vegetables and whatnot. Absolutely. Um, maintaining a neutral attitude towards food, I know is very hard because as adults, we know too much, but we don't <laughs> want to novelize or vilify any certain type of food. Um, and we need to respect and welcome that all food situations and cultures will eventually include foods that aren't on the plate, you know, or that are you know, scientifically supporting some kind of medical nutrition therapy. And those are the instances where we really show our true colors with our own biases towards food, um, you know, at birthday parties and cultural events. And for example, when your three-year-old opens the door because the Girl Scouts have come knocking, what do you do? that happened two weeks ago. So it's really interesting in practice to see how, how it pans out. Yeah. And I think you bring up an important point about like kind of checking your own internal biases. Um, that's something that I'd like to recommend for all parents to kind of, um, you know, before you get on this venture of like feeding your child, think like, what are your own thoughts about your, the foods and, mm -hmm. stuff and whatnot? Cause that's, Absolutely. And what are you bringing to the table? Like if you're sitting there and you're eating and you're not eating carbs, but your son is, your daughter's there and they, they're, they eventually will have questions about that. And, you know, it opens up a broader introspective experience with food and your food culture. Anywho, next question. My son is almost three and he doesn't want to, I think this means that he doesn't want to feed himself. What can I do? Okay. Um, so if he's three and he doesn't want to feed himself, um, that's an interesting question. So I, I would ask, ha, like, has he, like, is he did like, number one, like, does he have any like developmental delays? Um, like maybe, you know, are there other signs of, you know, possible, like, you know, getting him evaluated for, for other causes that, that could cause him to, to not want to feed himself? Or has he just been raised to always that somebody feeds him? Or like, does he not want to feed himself because he's distracted with the TV or the tablet or the phone? Or like, what is that environment around food looking like? Um, I think, again, kind of, you know, not thinking about the what we're eating, but like our environment is really important. Um, so um, just trying to check back on that environment um, and seeing, is it conducive? Is it relaxing environment to eat? Or does he, you know, does he feel stressed in, in mealtime? Um, I mean, there could be many reasons, um, but I, I would say maybe um, getting an evaluation, like, you know, speaking with the pediatrician, maybe there needs to be like some other like behavioral evaluation possibly, um, outside of nutrition. Right. I would agree. Okay. Hello. Someone said with a happy face. Love that. Thank you for that. I would love to know how to deal with textures. My almost three-year-old likes, read, loves black beans, but does not like any other type of bean and won't even deal with lentils. How do I help her to try other types of beans and legumes? Well, it's great that you got already got her on the black bean train. That's awesome, but okay. For, again, I think it kind of goes back to just that repeated exposure um, to the other beans. Um, you may want to ask your child. Um, so tonight, 
I have we have on the menu lentils. I know you don't typically like lentils, but is there a way that I can make lentils that, you know, is there a way that you would want to try the lentils if I made it a different way? So, um, you know, maybe that may be, you know, with having it with a certain food, or maybe that's, um, you know, um, the temperature of it, or it, you know, the, trying to see if there's possibly um, a different underlying reason as to why they don't want to try the other beans. Um, maybe if you blended it versus having it just um, whole. So trying to modify the, the presentation is important, um, but also making sure that it, when you're offering these new legumes that, again, you're not offering too large of, um, of a portion to overwhelm and, and kind of possibly excuse me, scare your child because we already know that they haven't liked it in the past. So just small, frequent exposures. Um, and again, trying to modify the, possibly the texture or um, the temperature or, or, or something of that sort and seeing if they can be creative as far as the way that they would want to try it. Indeed. And I think, you know, we, we often forget that not everyone wants to just eat a heap of lentils. I personally do, but beans that are in a stew or a soup tend to be very favorably received because there's other colors from, you know, a tomato sauce or a, cream, a coconut sauce or something creamy, you know, and, and you don't necessarily even need to make a, a big deal and be like, tonight we're having lentils, you know, it's just, here is a soup, you know, it is warm and hot and it is red and, you know, the exposure thing, because I, I can't stress how important it is if you serve it once, even though you poured a lot of sweat into that kitchen, into that, you know, coconut chickpea stew, if they say no and you never serve it again, really very quickly, your list of accepted foods just funnels. Okay, speaking of accepted foods, um, someone has written, my baby was born five pounds and now he's 13 months and weighs 17 pounds. We wanna know what we can do to make him gain weight. Should we see a specialist? So as far as, um, you know, it depends if, so have you, is your pediatrician concerned with the, the rate of weight gain? Um, if they've had, um, like a decline in their growth velocity, um, which you can, again, have that discussion with your pediatrician. Um, and if, your pediatrician and, you know, and, you, and if, even if your pediatrician may not feel that there's a big cause of concern, maybe you may want to request from your pediatrician or referral to like, you know, either, uh, you know, nutritionist, gastroenterologist, um, or whatnot, because that is kind of what, uh, what we do, um, is just making sure that, um, growth is, is optimized. Um, but, um, Again, just really looking at the growth curve over time and not one point in time is really um, what's important whenever there may be a concern for growth that may or may not be um, something like, you know, pertinent. And for a 13 month old, or I guess somewhere, or any child, what are the best foods to support weight gain? Which I know for you and me, we know that the dose makes the poison, so to speak, and any food can support weight gain. But what are the classic, I guess, more nutrient dense foods that people often turn to that I guess aren't as voluminous, that are more dense, that can support weight gain? Okay, yeah. Um, so for weight gain, um, you know, you want to think like what type of nutrient can give you the best, you know, bang for your buck, so to say. Um, and that tends to overwhelmingly be um, the type of calories that come from fat. Um, so ideally we wanna be promoting fat sources that are going to be um, more kind of like um, liquid fat sources. So things like olive oil, avocado oil, um, but even things like, you know, like, like butter, um, like creams and, and whatnot can also provide, be great sources of, of fat and nutrition for um, our babies. Because in 
infancy, especially, um, and even in, you know, in toddler years and in childhood, overwhelmingly, the, the needs for our calories to be coming from fat are much higher than that of adulthood. So, um, so they do need more fat calories. So things again, um, even avocados, for example, um, you know, um, like as long as there's no allergies, of course, um, like, like peanut butters and whatnot can be added to different foods, um, to help kind of help with, you know, boosting the caloric density. Yep. Avocado, nut and seed butters, oils, all those fats per gram, just because you're more likely to get full. I mean, you could technically gain weight eating grapes. I forgot I had my snack here. So I got really excited when I realized my grapes were still here. Um, but a child is more likely to get very, very full very quickly. So those tiny little things that pack a powerful punch are great ideas. This is really interesting. How much added sugar can a toddler have per day? I know it should be avoided, but some things like organic yogurt and whole grain Cheerios, which are good for them, have added sugars. Okay, so ideally, we don't want to be having any added sugars into um, the foods that we're providing for our, you know, infants, toddlers, um, and kind of going to that question about like the yogurt. So for yogurt, so organic yogurt, technically, if you're just getting a plain yogurt, shouldn't really be containing any added sugar. Um, probably the yogurt that you may be purchasing um, is going to be like a yogurt, like an organic yogurt with like, I don't know, I'll say like a strawberry banana flavoring or with, with some type of um, uh, added fruit to it. So whenever yogurts add fruit on the bottom or fruit in the yogurt, um, it's think of it almost like you're putting like a spoonful of like preserves or like kind of like that's more like the fruit that they're adding more so than actually like adding in a mashed banana because a mashed banana or strawberries or you know you know insert fruit is not going to actually contain added sugar so um if you want to provide a yogurt um which i am a huge fan of yogurts for for children and and adults as well um then try to go for more of like a plain yogurt that doesn't have any fruit or, or, or added flavors. And then you can add your own flavoring to it. So you can add your own ripe strawberries or bananas or insert, you know, fruit to it because technically it shouldn't be having any added sugars if it's only, you know, real natural fruit, but they usually don't do that. They usually do not do that. Indeed. Um, okay. How to promote healthy eating habits for a four-year-old? Her diet is very starchy. Okay. So um, first and foremost, I say I'd like to first, if, when we're trying to think of like my child, how do I promote these habits for my child? Look back at yourself and say, okay, like, my child is four years old. Their influences from the outside world are not as extensive as when they're older. So how am I eating? Like I've, I've had parents come to me like, oh, like they won't eat any fruits or vegetables. I'm like, okay, well, what fruits or vegetables do you like to eat? Like, oh, I don't really like to eat them. And I'm like, well, you know, they are, you're, you know, they're spun, their children are sponges. They mirror what their parent, what they see in front of them. And if what they're seeing from parents is that parents are not eating these fruits or vegetables or parents are having more of like a very starchy um, foods, then that's like, you know, first things first, try to see how you can be a good model for your child. Um, and if you are being an amazing model and trying to, you know, show an example of what having a balanced plate is on a regular basis, that's great. Um, Next thing is just, again, continuing to provide that exposure to those um, non-starchy foods. Um, so going back to earlier about the 
size and portions that we're providing when we're trying to kind of get our child more curious on it. Um, smaller portions of that newer food. And then also um, incorporating it into, again, things that they enjoy. Um, so that may look like, um, you know, possibly, you know, asking them like, well, what, like, you know, I'm eating this and this tastes, or this looks like, you know, X, Y, Z, like, so this broccoli, for example, it's like a little, it's a baby tree. So like kind of make it fun, especially like if you're, if your child's four years old, um, you know, making it play a playful time, something fun, playful, um, and not as, uh, you know, and not making them feel forced to eat that food. And just again, setting that example. I was so inspired that I brought my strawberry. Um, <laughs> but it's true. I mean, when you, it's, it's simple psychology, you know, you eating strawberries, fruits, vegetables in front of your children, constantly having them exposed to that begets them more likely to try things. Um, we're running out of time here, but I want to get in at least a couple more questions. How can I best support an overweight eight-year-old who expresses that they are constantly hungry? Okay. So for an eight-year-old who's expressing constant hunger and they're overweight, um, I think it's important to look at what kind of foods are you providing for that eight-year-old. Um, so you may need to try to provide more satiating foods. Um, so foods that are going to, so what that means is, so foods that are going to be more satiating. So things like protein. So are you just providing them with, um, you know, with, with just a bunch of like salads because you're concerned that they're an overweight eight-year-old. So I'm just going to give you a bunch of salads, but yes, yeah, salads will make you feel full, but then like, you know, 30, you know, minutes, an hour later, you're going to be hungry again because, you didn't have any protein. So having a source of protein, a source of, um, you know, a, a non-solid fat. So more of one of those like liquid fats as well, which sometimes protein sources will be sources of fat as well. So you don't have to add additional fat to those protein sources if it already contains fat. Um, but making sure that with every meal as well as snack, so it's important because we often forget at snack time to provide a protein source. Um, mm -hmm. And it snacks are usually just like a piece of fruit or some chips or, you know, you know, something that's just sugar. So sugar is important and we shouldn't like, you know, foods that contain sugar or carbohydrates are important and we shouldn't necessarily remove them um, from the diet, especially. Um, but we want to make sure that we're pairing a source of protein with every meal. So um, making sure, are you pairing that source of, of protein? Um, and making sure as well that you're not bringing up any um, kind of negative body talk to them um, and, and making them feel like they can't have certain foods because they're in a larger body. That's really important. And yeah, I see kids all the time having snacks, whether they're, you know, goldfish or carrots. And I'm like, aren't you hungry? Like, that's not enough for, like, I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> And absolutely, you know, you have to legitimize hunger and trust that their hunger is real unless you feel that there is an emotional intrusion that should be addressed. Um, but, you know, I mean, talk about in, there are times when there are increased nutrient needs. Being eight years old is one of them. Being pregnant is another one. Being nursing, lactating is another one. And yeah, we're hungry. And you have to sometimes eat what might not be a normal amount of food, but you have to make sure there's enough protein and fat to be satiated. Um, okay, we're going to take one more question and we didn't even get to so many of them. I feel like we could speak for the whole night. Wouldn't that be fun? Um, and get to our, some closing remarks. Um, okay. So this is interesting, kind of nuanced. How soon to introduce water to a baby? My son is almost eight months. He's also a very picky eater. Um, how many different food types should I have introduced already? Will the lack of variety affect his eating habits long-term? It's kind of a marathon question. I think a lot of people are probably like, how do I give water to my baby? When, when, when is that appropriate and how? So um, giving water to babies, we usually don't recommend it until about like six months of age. Um, and it's, and it's really, you know, 
max in the day about like four ounces possibly. Um, we don't want to be giving more than that just because still, you know, at six months, most, you know, we want to make sure that we're able to, to meet all their energy needs with um, whether it's breast milk or formula. Um, and then as they get closer to a year, you know, they, they do, they can have um, a little bit more water. Um, but it's important that you're providing them with enough um, fluid and hydration um, and their formula or breast milk will be providing them with that hydration as well. Um, so water is, you know, it's, it's not something that you should be withholding at, I think it was nine months, if I'm not mistaken. The infant. I believe seven or eight. Oh, okay. Seven or eight. Yeah. But seven. I mean, it's, you know, you know, is that like milk is the main source of nutrition, whether it comes from formula or breast milk up until the age of one water is for fun. I use it in this very cute little tiny cup. It looks almost like a silicone shot glass. And I'm trying to teach him how to, you know, and they love water. Babies love, maybe they love the cup, but they, he's, he acts like he's been in the desert for 40 years wandering around like, so, but I do have to limit it because, you know, I don't want it to displace his milk. Yeah. Okay, so this just in, everybody, we are going to have a part two to this topic <laughs> because there was such an incredible demand and interest and enthusiasm for this topic and for Christy. So there will be a part two. Stay tuned for when that will come around to you. Um, I would like to thank you all for being here tonight. I know it's quite late for us caregivers. <laughs> um, and I'd like to thank Christy and you help Jackson Children's Care for sharing their time and expertise with us. Um, I'm going to move into some announcements, but before I do, Christy has been generous enough to share some resources with us, including some books um, and a podcast um, that I personally really enjoy. And Rebecca Scritchfield was also a personal mentor of mine um, and she is fantastic. Um, and now some closing remarks for the Parental Guidance Series. So you can join us next month on Thursday, March 16th for our next parental guidance episode in Spanish, parental guidance, and please excuse my Spanish, I am learning. Cuando es que se debe elegir un centro de urgencia o una sala de emergencia, i.e. parental guidance, urgent care versus emergency department, when to go where. Es importante saber a dónde debes llevar a tu hijo para recibir la atención médica adecuada. Únase a nosotros para aprender primeros auxilios básicos y la diferencia entre un centro de urgencia y una sala de emergencia para que usted y su familia puedan estar mejor preparados cuando la vida no sale exactamente como estaba planeada. We all know that accidents happen. Having knowledge of first aid skills in those emergency situations can make a real difference. It's also very important to know where you should go for the appropriate medical care. Join us to learn basic first aid and the difference between an urgent care center and an emergency room so that you and your family can be better prepared when life doesn't go exactly as planned. And as a reminder, this will be in Spanish. Recordings of all parental guidance webinars as well as downloadable tips and resources can also be found at our new website, www.parentalguidance.org, where you can also sign up for any of our upcoming episodes. And with that, I will bid you all good night. Thank you, Christy. Thank you everyone on the back end who hosted this. It was really great to meet you all and we'll see you soon. <laughs>